So I guess uh, from yesterday's sessions, I don't need to emphasize anymore how popular smartphones are and how important to save battery life. Today, I'm going to present our design, Slomo, which helps to save smartphone energy by downclocking Wi-Fi. This is a joint work with my advisors, uh, Jeff Boker and Alex Snorin from UC San Diego. Researchers have shown that up to 70% of smartphone energy can be contributed alone by Wi-Fi. However, this, this does not mean that Wi-Fi do not have energy-efficient hardware. On the contrast, Wi-Fi manufacturers have put in tremendous amount of effort in designing energy-efficient chipset. For example, the power consumption can go down from 700 milliwatts in active to 10 milliwatts in sleep. So what went wrong in this picture? In a high level, Wi-Fi manages power saving by duty cycling of radio. That means when Wi-Fi is not used, it goes to sleep. And then it wakes up occasionally to send and receive data. Once it's done with data reception and transmission, it goes back to sleep again. So over the years, many, many variants have been proposed by the research community for better sleep policies and mechanisms. However, Wi-Fi wi energy saving on smartphone still remain a big challenge for the following two reasons. First, many smartphone apps are real-time and, and uh, real-time and chatty in nature. That means they either prevent your Wi-Fi from entering into sleep mode or waking up your Wi-Fi very frequently. In addition, app developers may intentionally or unintentionally put Wi-Fi in constantly awake mode. For example, this could be energy bugs or apps or developers simply want to put Wi-Fi in awake mode to reduce network latency. On the other hand, Wi-Fi usage pattern on smartphones also give us some unique opportunities that we might be able to exploit. Frequent demand do not equal, does not equal high demand. Even though those apps are making a lot of network requests, if you look at it, their data rate actually is pretty small. In fact, app developers are, well, in general, very conservative in terms of data rates. They are typically in the range of a few tens to hundreds of kilobits per second. In addition, due to the increasingly dense deployment of access point. Users are primarily connecting on Wi-Fi for network access. And whenever they do connect on Wi-Fi, they get a good Wi-Fi signal strength. So before I move on, on talking about how should these opportunities be leveraged to save energy, let's just first understand where does Wi-Fi spend its energy? At the beginning, your Wi-Fi might, in, might be in sleep state, and then it wakes up to send and receive data. Once it's done with sending and receiving data, it enters into, it enters into a idle mode. So it stays in the idle mode for a while for energy and latency consideration before it goes back to sleep. At the first look, since the Wi-Fi does nothing in idle state, you might think, oh, wow, the power consumption in idle should be pretty small. Actually, this is not true. If you look at the right-hand side, which is a power measurement of a real Wi-Fi uh, chip side, the power consumption for idle is orders of magnitude larger than sleep. Because in idle mode, your Wi-Fi is still expect to send and receive data instantaneously. That acts, so, the, so your entire Wi-Fi radio chain, radio chain is powered up. That also explains why idle mode is in the power consumption for idle is in the same order of transmission and reception. Given how Wi-Fi manages power state, now let's get back to see how we could leverage these opportunities for energy saving. In the past, normally when you have a good SNR, you will send and receive data at a much, at a much higher rate so that your Wi-Fi can go back to sleep earlier. Unfortunately for smartphone apps, your data rate is pretty small, so the time you spend in transmission and reception is actually way smaller compared to the time you spend in idle mode. So sending fast and receiving fast do not really help. In this case, how can we still leverage in the good SNR and somehow treat SNR for energy saving? So this is the question Slow-Mo aims to answer. And then the solution we propose is downclocking Wi-Fi. Power consumption of CMOS device is proportional to its clock rate. Assume, imagine we can downclock Wi-Fi. What would be the benefits? So researchers have reported that 30 to 46% energy saving can be achieved if Wi-Fi is in downclock mode. We know dynamic voltage and frequency scaling for CPU has been around for many years. So why not on Wi-Fi? It turns out that we have to blame Nyquist for that. 
Nyquist says, sampling rate has to be at least twice of your signaling bandwidth. That said, a 22 microhertz Wi-Fi signal requires at least a 44 microhertz sampling rate. Initially, you might think, well, sampling rate should only affect my an uh, analog to digital converter. However, if you look at the Wi-Fi diagram, Wi-Fi architecture a little bit closer, you will realize actually the entire digital circuitry is driven by the same clock. In a sense, the, the clock rate on your Wi-Fi chipset is entirely gated by the sampling rate. Looks like, looks like there's nothing we can do to bring the clock, to bring the clock rate down beyond Nyquist. While well, this statement is not 100% true, the reason advances in compressive sensing allow us to cheat a little bit when your information rate is way smaller compared to the signaling rate. Chopper et al. showed how to decode such a sparse signal using much lower sampling rate. Well, even though in this process, we might lose some degree of signal fidelity, but if you have good signal-to-noise ratio, which, which is exactly the opportunity we have for Wi-Fi on smartphone, this won't be a concern. So we observed that their decoding process shares a great degree of similarity as direct sequence spread spectrum used in Wi-Fi. DSSS is the modulation scheme you use in Wi-Fi when sending, sending and receiving data at one or two megabits per second. So what's DSSS? In a very high level, for DSSS, on the sender side, rather than sending a single information bit one, you send an 11 chip buffer sequence. So in this particular example, you send a bit stream of Sorry. You send a bit stream of 10110111000. As you can see, my signaling rate is 11 times larger than my information rate. On the receiver side, you need to sample each chip at least once. So all together, you need to collect 11 samples in order to recover your information bit. Since we know that the signal, the, the information is really, the signal is sparse, <coughs> And then there are a lot of redundancy being built into the signal itself. So in slow-mo, rather than sampling each chip individually, we sample a combination of the chips. In this particular example, the first sample corresponding to the sum of the first four chips, and then the second four chips, and then the last three chips. <coughs> Till now, I've shown you how we can receive information in time clock mode. Can we also send information in, in time clock mode as well? You know, your standard Wi-Fi expecting regular Wi-Fi signal. And this regular Wi-Fi signal would allow your receiver first lock onto the signal and then decode the signal. So here's what I mean by locking onto the signal. So your incoming signal correlate with a barcode sequence, and then we keep track on the correlation output. Whenever the correlation output cross a predefined threshold, we declare the signal is now locked. Sometimes if you get a really noisy signal, your correlation output may never cross the threshold. So in practice, in order to accommodate for transmission errors and noise, the threshold is normally set several times smaller than the ideal correlation peak. With time clock transmission, for the same duration of an information bit, because we're running at a slower clock rate, we can only send a fewer number of sequences. So a concern or a challenge here will be, would this shorter sequence still be recognized by the Wi-Fi receiver? By analyzing the properties of self-correlation of barcode sequence, we carefully design and construct, we carefully design and approximate the or original barcode sequence with shorter sequences. This example shows a three-chip sequence. When correlating with the standard barcode sequence, you also give us some correlation peak, even though this peak does not look as nice, as sharp as the peak you have seen on the previous slide. But it is sufficient enough to cross the threshold and successfully fool the receiver to think this is a valid Wi-Fi signal. To allow for a wide range of down clocking rates options, we have constructed and computed all nine possible shorter sequences, with each sequence corresponding to a different down clocking rate. For example, a sequence of length four corresponding to 36% down clocking rate. So far, everything looks great. Do they work in practice? We implement our design on Microsoft Sora, which is an open source software radio platform. I want to emphasize a few things here. First, our design is entirely backwards compatible. It requires zero modification on either your access point or the network infrastructure. In addition, 
It works on any Wi-Fi device that is capable of sending and receiving data at one or two megabits per second. Let me first give you some micro-benchmark results. In the first experiment, we try to answer the following question. Does Dan Clark reception work? If so, how much worse does it compare to standard Wi-Fi? So we repeat this set of experiments for a bunch of different SNRs. The x-axis shows the percentage of full clock rate, and the y-axis shows the frame reception rate. Let's look at the result for standard Wi-Fi first. Of course, as you might expect, if your SNR is good, you get 100% packet reception rate. When your SNR is poor, even standard Wi-Fi can only achieve 53% frame reception rate. Now let's start to add in the results for a dark cloud reception. Looking at a graph, when SNR is good, there's almost no difference between standard Wi-Fi and the slow mode with all clocking with all down clocking rates. When SNR is bad, your standard Wi-Fi can only achieve 53% of frame reception rate. With for slow mo with the slowest clock rate, we can also achieve 40% frame reception rate, which is only 23% worse compared to the standard Wi-Fi. Now let's reverse the link direction. And having slow mo sending a thousand bytes UDP packets to a standard Wi-Fi receiver. Again, we repeat this experiment for a bunch of different SNRs. So uh, similar setup as previous slides. The x-axis shows percentage of full clock rate, and y-axis shows frame reception rate. And the standard Wi-Fi operates at 100% clock rate. So depending on the SNR, your frame reception rate could go from anywhere from 100% to 8 to 9%. Let's introduce the results for down clock transmission. Well, this time, slow mo with lowest clock rate, that's 20%, does not really quite work. However, if you look at the second and lowest clock rate, that's, that is the 27% clock rate, uh, slow mo approximately attain the same performance as a standard Wi Fi. So, really, the takeaway, the takeaway message here is if you have a good SNR, slow mo just be, behave like your normal Wi Fi. Now, let's put Snowmo in smartphone app context and say whether Snowmo helps the apps to save energy. So we employ a trace-based uh, evalu energy evaluation approach and construct a power model based on real smartphone measurements. So we study eight popular smartphone apps with each app has at least one million downloads. We collect 200 seconds of high-fidelity Wi-Fi traces, which later on would allow us to reconstruct energy consumption. In order to accommodate any hardware or implementation variations, we repeat the same set of traces on both Google Nexus S and iPhone 4S. For the subsequent set of slides, I'm going to present the results for Google Nexus S, although the results for iPhone should follow that. First, let's take a look at Angry Birds. So Angry Birds represent a wide range of many free and offline apps you find on smartphones. While being offline, you might think it should consume zero network energy. Actually, this is, unfortunately, this is not true. Because you still have, for many of the free apps, you still have an embedded S module, which constantly talks to the S server for sending location updates and retrieving customized ads. As a result, the network energy could be as high as 75% of the entire app energy, including display, as a, as a paper reported last year in Eurosys. Getting back to our result, so we break the total energy consumption into different states. Looking at the sleep state first, there's no difference between Wi-Fi and slow-mo. Now let's start to add the energy consumption for transmission and reception. Sorry. Ooh, slow-mo actually performs worse than Wi-Fi. So what's happening? It, it, well, because we know that slow-mo send and receive data at a slower data rate. So likely, for the same amount of data, it needs longer time to send and transmit. Therefore, the network energy actually goes up a little bit. Now that's going to add, now let's add the idle energy, which is also the dominant part, and see how it changes. Wow, Slomo is able to significantly reduce the idle energy. Even though we spend a little bit more on transmission and reception, but if you look at it overall, we're able to save 25% of the app's energy. One might imagine, suppose there's no sleep energy. Presumably, Slomo should perform even better. And this is, this, is, this is exactly the case for real-time apps. So for real-time apps, your Wi-Fi is constantly sending and receiving data. Therefore, it actually never goes to sleep mode. 
So let's take a look at a trace for Skype voice. As expected, Snowmall is able to save 30% energy. Well, Angry Birds and Skype voice represents many of the real-time chatty low data rate apps we have discussed at the beginning of the talk. So what if the app has really large high data rate? Would slow-mo still work? So we evaluate slow-mo on a video trace, well, on a trace capture for a high fidelity video chat on Skype. The bi-direction data, the sum of the bi-direction data rate is 1.8 megabits per second. As you could imagine, um, slow-mo spend most of his time in either transmission or reception. Hence, over, as, a, as, a, as a result, overall, slow-mo could only attain marginal 3% saving compared to default Wi-Fi implementation. However, if you look at all the, if you look at the results for all the apps, most of the apps are first idle dominated in terms of network energy, and also they have low data rate. For these cases, slow-mo could help you to save energy anywhere from 18% to 34%. Well, we know nothing's free. So what does slow-mo cost us? As we have touched previously, slow-mo send and receive data at a lower data, at a, at a lower data rate. That said, if, if you have the same amount of data, likely for slow-mo, it takes longer to send and receive. The additional time occupied by slow-mo might potentially be used by other nodes in the network for communication. So we want to quantitatively understand this additional IL time overhead. We define a measurement metric called uh, IL time contraction, which is a ratio between free channel IL time and the default Wi-Fi and free channel IL time and the slow-mo. The larger the ratio, the higher the overhead. Also, a ratio of one means there's 0% IL time overhead. We compute this metric for all the traces we have except Skype video. If you, it turns out that the maximum ratio is 1.15, which is equivalent to 13% additional IL time overhead. Given that, we, we, given that past research have indicated that network frequently do not run at 100% utilization, and the energy saving we are able to achieve with slow-mo. At the most, the 13% IL time overhead seems like a pretty reasonable trade-off to make. Well, even though the IL time overhead is small, it still be very nice to have, be able to downclock Wi-Fi and have 0% IL time overhead. In a paper published on Mobicom 2011, eMini redesigns the entire Wi-Fi frame format to allow downclock packet detection and revert back to full clock for transmission and reception. We compare slow-mo with eMini on all the traces we have. It turns out, ex except for Skype video, slow-mo uh, slow is able to outperform eMini for all cases. Overall, if you look at energy saving, slow-mo is able to attain 13% better compared to e-mini in terms of energy saving. Slow-mo trades SNR for energy saving and is able to enable Wi-Fi in downclocking mode across all communication states. Being an entirely backwards compatible solution, slow-mo can work on any Wi-Fi device that's capable of sending and receiving one or two megabits per second. And finally, uh, slow-mo helps many smartphone popular apps and for, to save energy, and the energy saving can be as high as 34%. With that, I'd like to end my talk, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, hey, Philip Levis, Stanford University. So on one hand, I think this is really cool. You really show how you can, by downclocking the CMOS, you know, uh, take advantage of higher SNR links and when you don't quite need the, the high bit rate. The thing I'm concerned about is certainly at the link level this works, but how it's going to play out at the MAC level. If you have a downclocked receiver and say an AP is using RTS CTS, a distant one, you're not going to be able to decode those CTS sequences that you would be able to if you weren't downclocked. So you're not going to obey them. You're not going to interact with the MAC properly. Um, is, that, is that right or am I no, missing that's, something? That's actually not true. So even for RTS and CTS, if if you assume that the Mac would send out RTS and CTS at one megabits or two megabits per second, we're able to decode it. Furthermore, the other thing we observe that is, for actually for many of the networks, in order to minimize additional overhead, RTS and CTS never actually. No, no, I think that's right. Many networks yeah. do not use RTS CTS. That right. is separate from the question as to whether RTS CTS will right. work. So you're right. You can decode one and two megabits, but you reduce your sensitivity, right? 
you can do so at a higher SNR. Like by definition, you're introducing bit errors, right? So you can decode some CTS sequences, but there'll be some you could have if you weren't downclocked that you'd be able to, that you won't when you are. And this, I mean, this is a minor, certainly it's not like right. this is gonna, it'll still mostly work, you're right, most things don't use RTS, CTS. But I, there is sort of, I think, this area where it, might, you know, it can't quite interoperate, right? Yeah, so actually we, we actually measure that. So if, assume that you are right, if CTS and RTS is sending out other data rates, for sure Stomo couldn't be able to decode that. But if, let's say CTS and RTS is, is indeed sending out one way to megabits per second, we actually measure the uh, receiver sensitive, sensitivity in that sense. So it, it turns out that, so for the uh, transmission and reception results we have seen, even, even the SNR is really low. Like in some of the cases, we only got a six or 10 dB SNR. Slow-mo is still be able to uh, achieve like 80 to, 90%, 80 to 90% of the frame, de uh, frame reception rate. So in some sense, its range does not really affect by that. Also, if you look at a slow-mo, you operate on on AO to the 11B, which naturally has a large distance con compared to 11G. So talking about the operation range, I think that might be less a concern. Great, thanks. Uh, this is uh, Mian Dong from Samsung Electronics. Uh, very nice talk. So yes. I have a question regarding to the experiments part. Sure. So how did you get the energy breakdown of the TX, RX, ADO, et cetera? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, in fact, so if you look at a Wi-Fi package traces, whenever they go to um, sleep and then they wake up from sleep, they actually send a null packet to the access point. So we're able to, based on the null packets, and we're able to trace whether the Wi-Fi is in sleep or is active mode. Yeah, so uh, how did you get the energy number? Did you use the meter oh, to measure or? That's a good question. So uh, we, we base our, we construct a power model based on um, a real uh, smartphone measurement results as the base, and then we estimate, so for down clocking energy consumption, we use the, uh, we estimate the energy based on a linear model. We actually cover more in our paper, but the things I want to emphasize is so, the energy consumption for down clock mode, we actually have a pretty conservative estimate for that. Thank you, uh, and second question, so uh, just one comment. Uh, uh, at the beginning of your slides, I see a uh, 700 milliwatts of Wi-Fi energy, so yep. that is uh, like no way. So um, if you look at the data sheet of the Wi-Fi chipset by Qualcomm, Broadcom, or TI, the energy consumption should be like three or 200 B second tops. Oh, I, I forgot to mention, when 700, that means when you are transmitting data. Okay. Does, does that? Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, I'm Arpit from NC State. My question is that, uh, like you said, it, it will be useful for chatty applications, right. but the one which, which are data intensive, it will not be useful. But when you use in practical sense, I mean, there will be multiple applications using the network at the same point of time. So have you considered that scenario? Maybe uh, it may not be useful, or like what, what will be the mechanism to determine when it is uh, downclocking is useful or when it is not useful? Uh, that's a good question. But if you look at the way how we use apps on smartphone, they're pretty much mutually exclusive, right? because everybody might want to share screen. So when you launch one app, the other app automatically closed. So the multiplexing on apps on, Wi-Fi, on network layer is, the degree is actually pretty small. So that ends up may not be a concern because you mix a bunch of apps. But you are, you are certainly right. If, if end up you combine a number of apps, you end up that you have really high data rate, that might be a concern. Okay, yeah. thank you. Hi, I'm Matthew Mosher from USC. Uh, what's the effect of elongating the uh, receiving and sending time on the quality of the uh, programs? For example, what's uh, the effect on latency or the video quality on the Skype application? Oh, um, so for yeah, so for Skype video, yes, it might affect the latency. But we actually have a real Skype voice chat on um, slow mo with down clocking rate. We didn't see any. We didn't see. We, act, we didn't see any perceivable difference when at a different down clocking rate. If you have a good SNR, so it won't be a concern. Yeah. Thanks. Okay.